This is Have You Met. My guest today is a world-renowned skier who lost the use of his legs after a freak skiing accident. He went on to beat the odds and ended up making it into the US Ski and Snowboard Hall of Fame and the Paralympic Hall of Fame. His 13 Paralympic medals are more than any other male monoskier in Paralympic history. He's the first paraplegic to successfully summit Kilimanjaro almost without assistance. In 2005, the Dalai Lama named him an unsung hero of compassion. Have you met Chris Waddell? So Chris, tell me about the, your first experience skiing and, and how old were you when you first got into skiing? I cannot tell you what my first experience was like because I was so young. I have, wow. I have some, I have some photos and, and I guess I was a fairly active kid that might, that, that might be an understatement. I have some aunts who say that I was a nightmare. Uh, so, so yes, yeah, so I was active and I am the oldest of two. My brother is 28 months younger than I am. So I guess I wanted to ski. My father skied. It seemed cool. I wanted to do it. I had skis. And, and so I have some photos of, of the dog, Thor, our German shepherd, and me in, in our yard. And, and that was pretty much it. And I guess that my mother said to me, she said, look, if you're going to do this, you're not coming in and out. You're leaving your skis on. And, and then she worried that people driving by would worry that she was abusing me, that she'd lock me out of the house. And she's like, no, 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 it's all him. He wants to do it. You know, the red cheeks, all of that stuff. So that really, that really is kind of when it started. And, and I think that was like one, two kind of thing. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, so super young. I guess I was at a mountain the first time at, at three and still don't really remember that. I started racing when I was six. We had moved to Western Massachusetts on a mountain of about 680 feet of vertical. So like wow. half the height of the Empire State Building kind of thing. So, so not a gigantic mountain by any means, but it was 10 minutes from the house. And so that's really kind of when my memory of skiing actually started. Wow. Yeah, that's 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 amazing. So you basically were skiing when you could walk or, or even before almost. <laughs> pretty pretty close, yeah. Pretty close. I guess. I mean, I don't know. I mean, for me it's it's like family history, family legend or whatever. So yeah. Believe whatever you want to believe, I guess, is what it comes <laughs> down to as well. Yeah. So were your whole family skiers? We were. So my father, my grandfather, my father's father had worked for General Electric and he was, he put in turbines throughout the world. And so that's what he did throughout his life. And he was, I guess, working in the Pyrenees when my father was in high school. And so my father ended up going to four different high schools. And so for one year, he went to high school in Switzerland. And that's where he started learning. So I think he was 17 years old. And that's where the skiing thing started. So this was, I don't know, 1960, 60 something like that 64 65 maybe I'd have to do the math to figure out so that's really when it started he started skiing and you know I think one of their first dates my my mother started skiing with my father and apparently they stuck together so that's good that was that's one of the yeah. lessons right is never you know boyfriends are not supposed to teach girlfriends how to ski it's the best way to ruin a relationship right but apparently it worked i think she cut her leg or something like that and had to go get stitches and so uh so yeah all again part of the family legend i wasn't around for any of that so i can't i can't corroborate any of their story <laughs> yeah but it's just as far as you can remember skiing has just been all around you and and all to do with your hobbies and passions and everything like that yeah, it is. But it's also, as I mentioned, it was a small mountain, right? I mean, we grew up in a in an area. It's not like growing up in the Alps or something like that, where it's embedded in the culture of yeah. the area and the town and the family. It just was something that my parents had chosen to do. And we we followed and we we loved it. I mean, I loved going to the mountain. It was it was the greatest thing, I think. Yeah. And so at six, you said you were ski racing. Is that right? I started ski racing. So my, when we moved, my father started uh, teaching skiing. So he was an instructor. My mother worked for the ski patrol and then eventually uh, started teaching as well. And so we were there and it's this tiny little mountain. And I saw the 
older kids over there ski racing. And I said, that looks cool. I want to do it. And so that was essentially it. It was, it was a bit of a godsend in many ways, just in that the coach was this young, vibrant guy who had recently graduated from college, was in the area doing graduate work. And, and so he wanted to continue to ski to coach. So that was essentially what happened is that he started doing that. We had this, this amazing coach and it just, it, yeah. I mean, I think it was just, it just ended up being a cool thing. It was, it was dumb luck that, that we just ha- sort of happened into this. And so, yeah, six, six years old, all I did, my best friend was six as well. His brother was seven years older, I think. And so he was part of this like 13 year old contingent and his six year olds, we thought, that they were the coolest people yeah. like on earth. And so they let us, they let us follow them. And that's pretty much what we did. We just, we just <laughs> followed them around. That was pretty much all we did. Yeah. Well, I guess, yeah, you, you'd follow them around and you figured out how to ski and got better and better at skiing. And you were probably better than them by their age. I, I would imagine a lot better. Um, so then take me forward, right? So you, you're six years old, you're ski racing. How did it just become more and more, a part of your life or, or did it become more and more a part of your life for the, over those next few years, kind of as you come into teenager, that sort of age? Yeah, no, it really, it really was more and more a part of my life. I mean, it's just, and, and obviously we were, we were uh, reliant on the season to a certain extent. Yeah. This area that we went to was owned by a construction company and their motto was always white day or night. So one, they had amazing ski, uh, amazing snowmaking. So they, they could cover the mountain in like, you know, and there wasn't much of the mountain to cover, but it seemed like they could cover it in, you know, like a week or something like that. But they also had lights at the mountain. So you could ski until nine o'clock at night. And, and, and that's just, that's really ultimately what we did. And, and so, yeah, up through, I mean, there were times, like as a little kid and we were, we were independent as well. I think for a lot of the community, it was almost like parents felt comfortable dropping their kids off at Mount Tom, which is where I grew up. And they'd come back three hours later or four hours later. And the kids had the, had the run of the place. I guess they probably figured there was only so much trouble we could get into. There probably was, you know, we probably could have gotten into more trouble if we, if we (laughs) wanted to, but but yeah, that was, that was pretty much it was just get and, and so got into racing and got better and better by, by the time I was 13, I was sort of number one in the, in the region, you know, which was not a, not a gigantic region. It was Massachusetts, Connecticut and Rhode Island. So it's not necessarily the hotbed of skiing where, you know, up North New Hampshire, Vermont were, were really more considered, you know, were, were considered better uh, Maine as well. But, uh, but yeah, so, so that's really, you know, that's, that's what I started doing, but it wasn't, uh, you know, it's kind of an interesting thought. It's not, it was not the, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, it was not like the idea of, of, okay, this is the gateway to the Olympics. This is the gateway to fame. This is, it was kind of like, this is, this is what we did. And, and, and you wanted to go as fast as you could. And really yeah. it was, it was sort of, you know, I, I kind of look back on it and think, oh, you know, it would have been nice to sort of, you know, would it, it seems more, it would have been more appropriate, I guess, in some ways to indulge that, that dream. I and mean, we saw Franz Klammer back in 1976 and it was like, okay, that became skiing for us. And uh, obviously Ingemar Stenmark and the Mayer brothers and things like that were, you know, that, that was part of our culture as well. But uh, but yeah, was, those were to me, I think, and, and, you know, disappointingly, they were the people on television. It would, they weren't the people in our little town, I guess. Yeah. So, so that, that kind of came later, I guess. Yeah. So do you remember that, like that kind of gradual transition from this just being a passion, a hobby, something you just do and always have done to, or I don't even know if there was this moment, but did it become more of a, oh, okay, maybe I can do something and maybe I can make this my career or maybe I can, you know, go to an Olympics when, when it did it and when did it cross your mind? You know, it was, it was kind of an interesting thing. So I started at such a young age that I was racing in 13 and under in that category 
for seven years or something like that, or eight years or something. It's almost like, like half of my career was under 13 years old. And, and so it was, it was kind of like, there was this step from being 13 and under to 14 and above where I mean, I have to draw attention to it, right? Where, where people had like mustaches and stuff like that. I mean, I guess this has got to be your signature, right? Uh, or at least part of the signature. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, you go from being a little kid to suddenly being a grown up, and and for me, that was actually a really difficult transition. I don't think that I really had the. I don't know. I don't. I don't think I had the wherewithal to kind of wrap my mind around what it meant to to be an adult and and sort of the sort of the process of like getting incrementally better even when you're 14 years old and you're racing against somebody who's 20 or something like that and and there's a profound difference yeah and, and so wow i've just had a i've just had a turkey come into my uh into my oh no a bunch of them <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm getting distracted right now. I'm getting invaded by turkeys. I, has that ever happened on the podcast here? I kind of want to see them. I kind of want you to turn it. <laughs> I know. I, I could. This is, this is a podcast first, actually. <laughs> well, I, I, can, can I do that? Where, where Invasion that? of the wild turkeys. I know. I know. I'm trying to see. Well, two of them came through and now they're not in a, in a great place, but, but I'll see if they, if they get a little bit closer here. But yes, I... I think I feel like it's relatively safe, though. I don't. I don't think. I, I don't think I'm at risk. So, so no need to send reinforcements or anything. That's good to know. That's good. That's a relief. Yes, exactly. Yes, I know. I can see you were you were a bit nervous, but you were you were a long way away. I don't think that you'll be able to help me out. But but anyway, back to back to racing. You know, I mean, it's I, I went I went a year and a half without finishing a race, and I think that it was. It was sort of like, I often say skiing was my greatest teacher and that it was where I kind of had my greatest success, but also where I had my greatest difficulties and, and difficulties in terms of looking at who I am, who I think I am, what I'm all about, those kinds of things, and and whether I could be successful, right? I mean, I think that that in some ways, it's like there was always the nervousness, always the the sense of, of like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm nervous before the start, but then there's also the question of like, you know, how can I, how can I manage that? How can I perform in the moment? And, and I succumbed to the moment early, early on and sort of that next step. And that was, that was probably, probably in a lot of ways, the biggest challenge. I mean, we'll get to the, to the idea of the accident at some point, but, but really that was probably a more profound in some ways, uh, uh, challenge than than breaking my back was. Yeah, that's that is that's crazy. Yeah. So what was, I mean, during that transition, and you said you went a year and a half without finishing a race. What do you mean exactly? You didn't finish. You mean I'm assuming you weren't falling over and stuff like that at that point because you were no, this no, little was, hot, hot would, shot. Yeah. No. I mean, I would, I would. I mean, that's you. You crash. I mean, that's part of it. You're pushing the limit. You don't. You know, make the gate. You you fall. You lose a ski. Yeah. You do whatever. You know, and this was this was over and over and over oh, again. Yeah, okay. Where it really just feels like quitting is the best alternative because at least it it stops the pain. It stops the the feeling of of failure, of profound failure, yeah. both in terms of the act and in terms of the person who was me. Yeah. You know? I can imagine that being really demoralizing. Yeah. So yeah, 18 months and you just, you keep getting up and just going again, just uh, go again. How often would you race? Uh, you know, I mean, so we're racing generally like twice, a, like Saturday and Sundays, you know, so probably for two and a half, three months or something like that. So, so yeah. I, had, I had ample opportunity to, to, to fail and, and, yeah. and I took full advantage of that opportunity. Yeah. Well, it's nice to have the opportunity to fail. And yeah, like that kind of environment where there's no, no real downside. You're just going to character building and, and build your skills and learn how to fall and <laughs> all that kind of stuff. So you rate, you're 14, you're racing against people of all ages, I assume, um, at that point, because you said there were guys in their 20s and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Wow. So, 
and then when did you yeah kind of stop falling and start finishing and start climbing up the ranks and start thinking maybe maybe i can yeah take it further and that kind of thing yeah so it really was it really was it must have been uh really kind of middle of of sort of being 15 i kind of kind of started putting things together and then but then I had to kind of rebuild myself, both, you know, sort of technically, tactically, emotionally, all of those things. And, and, and so started the next, the, the, probably when I was 16, I guess it was that I, that I started and rebuilt and, 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 you know, skiing's a weird sport in that, you know, and, and like a lot of things in that the objective is, is really to let go is is not to think about what you're doing but to but to let go and and really to perform to to go and perform and and let the training take over and all of those things but that's a real challenge i mean that's the challenge especially when you've proven that you're not super successful at it so so let's 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 keep engaged with the with the mind you know the the regulator here to make sure that you're not going to get yourself in trouble and and so so that ultimately was the was building back and building back to to that point of being confident, you know, which I think that confidence is one of those confidence is one of those weird things, isn't it? Because it's yeah. uh, it you perform at your best when you're confident, and and everybody attributes that. Well, I was I was confident. That's that's why I was successful. And you go, well, that's awesome. Like that's, that's absolutely great that, that you could do that. It's 95% mental and you go, okay, but what if I'm not feeling confident that that 95% seems like it's going very much against me. And so, so, so yeah, being effectively being responsible for your own confidence and building your own confidence uh, sort of manually, you know, because it's something that I think that we think that it's almost it's almost instinctive. It's, it's, it's intuitive. It's, uh, you know, it's inherited in some ways Mm. that, and it's not, you know, I think that, that there ebbs and flows for all of us. And so it's a matter of, of sort of being responsible for that. And I was being responsible. The Olympic part of it for me was never, I never thought that I was going to the Olympics. I really didn't. Uh, college ski racing was going to be effectively my Olympics. It was going to be when I was able to compete against the best people and compete against some of those people who did have that as a as a realistic dream or at least yeah. a semi-realistic dream. And and so, so it was going to be my my chance to put myself on the line and figure out how good I could be. And I think that that's the, that's the big question for all of us, right? It's so easy to, in a lot of ways to go through life and never really put ourselves in the position where we risk it all, where we risk that profound failure and falling flat on our face and going, huh, well, you tried, it didn't quite work out. So what are you going to do now? Uh, You know, the playing it safe part is, is something that I think is a huge part for, for all of us. And, and, you know, I, I don't know, I've come around to the idea of the greatest risk that I can take that we can take is taking no risk at all. And, and when I went to college, I really wanted to take that risk and see, you know, see how good I could be and, and know that as I moved on to whatever the definition of an adult life is that, that at least I knew that I'd taken that chance and that, that I was armed and prepared on some level. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Cause it can go the other way, can't it? You can easily stop yourself. Yeah. Being in that position, you can hold back and you can hold back a little bit of what you have inside you. You can give like 80% on the day because then if you fail, at least you're like, Oh, it's all right. I could have done better. or I had a little bit more to give. I didn't, it wasn't my day. But it's hard to yeah go as hard as you can and tell yourself you want to go as hard as you can because then yeah if you fail you you got to look at yourself in the mirror and uh, and face it and deal with it and move forward. Um, so that was your the pinnacle like kind of pre pre accident pre injury that was the the pinnacle college college skiing racing. 
It was going to be, yes. That was that was really that was the end of the road in in a lot of ways, or at least the end of the road as far as I could imagine, yeah. athletically. And so, did like, you let's put it in? Did you have any idea like what you wanted to do at that point? Were you thinking like careers wise? Were you like, oh, I want to go be a lawyer, dentist, or something? Or <laughs> uh, you know, I, I had taken the first semester off of school and I worked for a law firm in New York City. Uh, so law was, was potential. I mean, it's, it's funny, right? Cause it's, it's almost like being a little kid, right? Where it's like, Oh, I want to be a fireman. I want to be, you know, and it's like, Oh, I want to be a lawyer. I want to be an investment banker. I want to be, you know, it's like, I, I, I don't know that I knew any of what those things actually meant, yeah. but it seemed like people around me were going and doing those things. And, and that if you were relatively intelligent and competitive and and that was a definition of success, that was a path to success. And so, so that I probably would have gone in one of those directions. I have no idea, you know, I, I yeah. can only speculate as to yeah. as to where how I might how it might have ended up. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, of course. Okay, cool. So let's let's go to so you did go to college, didn't you? Was it Middlebury College? Middlebury Is that right? College. Yep. Okay. So, so talk me through that. So what were you studying and like, how did it, how did you get into skiing up there as well? Just go through that whole thing. Sure. Yeah. So, so I was actually, I was studying international politics and economics, which in some cool. ways it sounds, it sounds pretty grand. And in other <laughs> ways it is a, you know, avoiding, avoiding making a real decision because it was sort of one part political science, one part economics, yeah. one part language. And so, so you really you kind of have like three majors and hedging <laughs> your bets and, and those kinds of things. I did, you know, the idea of working internationally was, was sort of, was appealing to me. Yeah. Uh, you know, whether, whether that ended up happening or not, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, well, it didn't happen I mean, other than. It not in of, that way. <laughs> yeah, not, not, not in the way that I ever imagined it. Uh, yeah. So in skiing, Middlebury was a small school. I think it was, I think it was seventeen or nineteen hundred students when I was there. So, so it was a small school in Vermont, but it was Division One skiing. So it was the the highest level of collegiate skiing in in the U.S. and and so it's a small team. And skiing's a little bit weird in that it is far more integrated uh, between the with the genders than, than any other sport, right? Because effectively men and women are on the same team as opposed to, you know, you you don't have that like on the uh, soccer, I was going to call it soccer. I mean, I'll translate for you the football. uh, I'm actually a big NFL fan, so you can call it soccer. That's fine. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Exactly. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Exactly. (laughs) And I I don't think that our football is integrated either, but, uh, but yeah, so, so skiing is, is really ultimately, you know, that, that was a big part of the reason for being there was, it was a great education as well. So this was an opportunity for me to, it was always like through life, it was kind of like balancing the two, right. Where, where school was always the number one priority, but sport was really where my heart was. And so, yeah. So, so do one to be able to do the other. And, and that's, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know where I, I don't know what I would have done. I, I have sometimes these sort of sliding door kind of moments where like, if I'm in New York city or something like that, I'm like, huh, I wonder if, I wonder if that would have been me, you know, if, if 30 years later or whatever, if that would have been me and, uh, and I, I don't know. I mean, I can no. create a story, but <laughs> the likelihood is that it wouldn't be right. You know? Yeah. No, I like looking at life like that as well. I'm thinking, yeah, everything is so changeable. It's like the butterfly effect. You could go back 20 years and say, if I hadn't spoken to that person that night on that night out, if I'd gone over to this person instead and spoken to them, maybe my life would have turned out completely different, right? Because they might, you might have gotten really well. They might have offered you this uh, a trial, a job. And then all of a sudden, you know, just everything can change. And I can look back at my life and highlight moments like that where like, okay, I shouldn't have been there, but I went there and I met this person and I should have gone home, but I stayed out and, you know, everything just, life is weird, isn't it? <laughs> it, it? It is, you know, and I think that that's the, 
you know, that's the message in a lot of ways. Like my foundation, we do, we do a school presentation called name tags. And it's about the yeah. labels that we put on ourselves and others, which are often our limitations. But the ultimate message from that is that our lives just take these twists and turns. And we have this idea of what we want to do, who we want to be, and we have a plan. And the likelihood is that that plan is not going to work out the way that we planned it. Yeah. And, and there's, you know, there's a risk of the emotional risk of like, oh no, now I've failed. I said that I was going to be a doctor and now I'm not a doctor. I've, you know, I've, I've become, you know, a kindergarten teacher or something like that, you know, and it's like, and that might've been what you were supposed to do all along is to be a kindergarten teacher and where your heart is, but it didn't fit within your, within your definition of, of how you were supposed to approach life. And so, yeah, I mean, I think it's it's kind of it's kind of the cool part, and it's kind of the cool part of having these kinds of stories out there and these kinds of examples of like, yeah, this was my plan, and and my plan didn't work out the way that I planned it, and and for me, I mean, I keep I keep going going beyond the 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 conversation here, but but you know, I I can't say that my quality of life is any is any worse than I would have imagined it would have, it would have been before it's, it's different. Yeah. And I think that there I've been open to, you know, to, to some experiences that I never would have, I never would have considered. I never would, have, that never would have been possible. And that's the cool part about, I guess that's the cool part about life, you know, and, and yeah. sort of there's a bit of an uncertainty built into it. Definitely. And if there is that uncertainty, then what's the, you know, what's, what's our relationship to the uncertainty? Are we okay? Yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah. The, our relationship to the uncertainty, yeah. where are we going to be? You know, I, I often think like that still, you know, where am I going to be in 12 months? I have no idea. You know, I might be back living in the UK. I might still be here. Maybe I'll be in another country around here. Who knows? You know, and that's, that's what's amazing. And maybe it'll all work out for a completely different reason. Like we just said, just, just random, things to change your path but let's go back to your path and let's go back to to college and uh let's kind of it's a weird way to say it but kind of build me up to to your to your injury and your accident and the kind of maybe the time leading up to that and yeah so so really ultimately when i went to college i felt like in some ways it was my last chance you know i think that that's that's probably one of the things that i probably have to take out of life because i think that I have looked at numerous things as my, as my last chance. This is my last chance to do it. And it's like, okay, it's probably your last chance until the next chance. But if you want to look at it as your last chance, then that's your last chance. And so, so it was my last chance. And, and I wanted to, you know, I wanted to stake my claim. I felt like I, I felt like I was good. I felt like I could be good, but I'd never proven that I could be good. And so, so we did a lot of what we call dry land training. And so dry land training is, you know, running and lifting and, and and various other exercises to prepare for the ski season before there's snow. And my goal every day was that I wanted to push myself to the point that I wanted to quit. And if I got to that point and I moved beyond that point, even incrementally, I was, it was creating a new narrative, right? So I was creating the yeah. possibility for, for a success that I'd never had before. I was opening my mind to that possibility and, and maybe the universe, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how, I, I don't, I don't know how universally oriented these whole things are, but, uh, but anyway, yeah, that, that was kind of the idea was, was if I could get there. And so like, there was one, there's one training session and we were doing a series of sprints. And as I said, it's, it's, it's men and women on the team together. And so, so we were doing all these sprints and then we had like, sort of like two groups and, and uh, not that it was separated by sexes by any means. It was, I think it was just sort of like, you know, this half this way, this half that way. And, and so we were doing these sprints and, you know, the coach would blow the whistle and, and you'd sprint, but then you'd have to sprint with like some carrying somebody on your back mm -hmm. or you'd have to do like, like, uh, uh, like, like frog jump kind of thing, you know, where you'd be in your talk and then you'd, You'd have to jump and then jump and then jump these, these broad jump kind of things. And, and so in the middle of this, I started feeling like I was going to be sick. 
like I was like I was going to vomit. And, and we have those telltale signs, right? I mean, it's kind of like your ears start to get like red and hot and sort of itchy and you get the saliva starting to gush yeah. in the back of your throat. And you're like, this is uh, this is coming. This is coming. I, I know it's coming. And and so that's that to me was like that that was that was the indication of like, OK, well, you've been trying to go as fast as you can and do this as best you can. Maybe you should back off. And this was, this was the quitting time. Right. And, but, but I thought, okay, well, this is it. This is my opportunity to define myself. And each time I came back to the line, the coach would blow the whistle. And I'm like, okay, this is it. This is, you just go absolutely positively as hard as you can, you know, and I come back and then I'd just be, you know, the stomach would just be tied in knots and all of these things. And I'm like, okay, okay, this is it. And you, you stare deeply into into the grass right you're just you're just looking into the grass just trying to trying to find some sort of balance to to get the world back on its axis and 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 i went over and over and over again that whole that whole series and one thing was i never i never got sick i was prepared for it and it was almost like i was antagonizing it you know i was like i i have this uh created this saying called run toward your fear And it's almost like that was my fear. My fear was that I was going to be sick in front of all of these people or whatever. You know, it's just it's a representation of of our limit as people. And and I never reached that limit. And, And that's the moment where you go, all right, huh. Well, I never reached that limit. I've set this artificial limit on myself but I've never actually reached it. And so so that was that was my preparation as I was going through the fall and get ready, getting ready for the ski season. And, and, and I was sore. I mean, I was sore. I mean, and this is when you know you're sore, right? I mean, you know, you're sore when, when you can't like sit down on the toilet, you know, like that's, that's when you really, when your legs are so sore and you're like, you're like, okay, I know I'm just going to have to fall the last like <laughs> two or three inches and it's going to be painful when I land. But, but that was like, that was like a weekly, you know, that was, that was weekly. That was just a standard for me. I became, I was that sore, but I was like, okay, that sore is representation. Like I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. And so, so I was, I was as ready as as I could possibly be, I'd broken myself down and, and I left for Christmas vacation, finished exams, you know, did that whole thing, packed up the, you know, the, the whole dorm room full of dirty clothes that were probably three feet deep on the floor, you know, because they'd just been discarded wherever and finishing exams and papers and all of that stuff and packed it up and and went home and, and my brother and I, my brother woke me up the next morning and he said, let's, let's go to the mountain, you know? And of course I, I just wanted to sleep, but, but I was like, okay, this is it. And my brother in some ways was living, living that dream. Like he, he was, he was the one who was, who was bolder than yeah. I was. He, he had said, Hey, I'm going to go to ski Academy. I'm going to, I'm going to see how good I really can be. And, and I was a bit, jealous in some ways, you know, that, that he had been at that age, he'd been able to make that decision where I hadn't been able to make that decision. I'd, I'd taken the, the, the mature route, right. The mature route of like choosing, well, I'll go, I'll go the academic way because that makes more sense and it'll prepare me for the rest of my life. And it's, uh, you know, sometimes safer and sometimes more mature and that can be debated and I'll let your audience <laughs> go and debate that. But, but for me, that's kind of the way I looked at it was that, that in some ways I had, I had closed my eyes to, to my potential dream and, and had found a, a, a beautiful way to spin it to say, oh, no, no, I'm making a more mature decision. And so he said, <laughs> you know, come on, get up, we're going to the mountain. And I was like, okay. And I got up and, and went to the mountain and, and this was going to be the opportunity really to, to put that time into skiing because, because I didn't have the academic part. We took, we took one class for the month of January. So really I was looking at a month and a half effectively where I could concentrate on my sport. And this was going to be the beginning. Mm. 
We went out and it was, it was warm and sunny. We skied at this, this place called Berkshire East. We'd moved from Mount Tom to Berkshire East, which was, I think like 900 or a thousand feet of vertical. So it was significantly bigger and, and was notoriously hard and icy. They called it oftentimes locals lovingly called it uh, Berkshire ice, you know, the beast of Berkshire ah. ice. And so, yeah. so that represented what the mountain was. And that's, and I think it was a badge of honor for us as well. It's like, okay, it's, it's steep, it's narrow, it's icy, and the conditions are difficult, and we love it. And so this is where it was. But that day, there was only one trail open. It had been warm. They had made snow on one trail, so it was all brown. And then there was this one, like, white snake of snow that, that went down the mountain. And it was warm and sunny that day. It was, it was like no hat, no no big jacket, any of that stuff. And I was just searching for the feeling, you know, you search for the feeling. It's, it's such a, you know, you do the physical part. And so that's one component of it, but then it's getting in concert with your equipment. It's getting in concert with your technique and searching for that feeling. And I'd had the feeling at the end of the previous year, but that was months prior. And so it was, kind of looking for it and you're just sort of going, oh, okay, does that feel right? Does that feel right? What am I doing? Am I, am I on top of it? And in the middle of a turn, my ski popped off. Nobody saw it. I don't remember anything after my ski popping off. Really? And, I, and I fell and from reconstructing it from, from my brother's account, from my friend's account, the guy who, who was the first one to me, it sounded like I fell in the middle of the trail. I told them I didn't think I'd hit the trees or anything. I guess it was, it was one of those. It was probably a fairly violent, you know, interaction with the ground. So, yeah. so that's probably where I was like, I'm not sure if I did because I, I went down pretty hard, but, but yeah, I broke two vertebrae and that was, you know, that was the change. And I don't, I was in, in shock. That's why I don't remember it. I was in so much pain. I broke, you know, thoracic 10 and 11 vertebrae. I broke a bunch of ribs. I broke a collarbone. Apparently I had a concussion. I did a pretty good job. And I guess I pulverized the vertebrae. The doctor who did the, the surgery said that it looked like a bad car accident, which is yeah. interesting because I wasn't going all that fast. I mean, I was probably going 20, 30 miles an hour kind of thing, you know, probably about 30 miles an hour or so, which doesn't seem fast when you're skiing and it seems fast when you stop abruptly. And apparently that's what happened. Wow. Yeah. That is something, isn't it? <laughs> um, how, how often have you like looked back on that day and just, I mean, I guess you tortured yourself with it for a while. That's what I would do. I would, I would torture myself and be like, if I'd done this differently, if I like, was that hard? How, how was that to deal with? That part is, it, it's the part, I mean, you get to, you get to a point where it is, it's, it's, it's simply about survival, right? Yeah. That, and, and it's almost like torturing yourself is something that you're allowed to do when you're in a more comfortable situation, mm. you know, when you're allowed to consider the possibilities and some things like that. And, you know, cause yeah, when something profound like this happens, you sort of look at it on a, on a karmic kind of level of like, how did I, how did I get to this point? What did I do that brought me to this point as opposed to, Hey, this is a moment in time and things happen. They can, yeah. they can move. And, and, you know, cause I had had, you know, I, I had effectively broken up with my girlfriend the night before kind of thing. Oh. And, you know, and it's one of those, it's like, okay, well, I wasn't very nice to her. And, and of course that's, you know, these things happen one on top of the other. So, so it's like, okay, by virtue of what I did to her, that was that th this is, this is my punishment. Right. And you can look at it and go, okay, this is it or whatever it is, you know? And it's like, and, and I really, I didn't have much of a choice, but to get better. And, and so, so I gave myself permission to get better. And, and in some ways, I think I was sort of lucky in that, you know, we make bad decisions. I mean, we make profoundly bad decisions. And I was in the trauma unit of the hospital and the trauma unit of the hospital is full of people who have made bad decisions. I mean, there was a guy in my room who had his leg in traction, who had 
and, and, and I know this from, from hearing it, hearing the stories from my family really, because I didn't know much of anything else, but had had a you know drunk driving accident and ended up in that situation as a result. And it was effectively like drying out. Like they tell these stories about hearing this guy effectively like drying out and going through all of those issues. And, uh, mm. you know, so I, I, in some ways I was doing what I love to do. It was ski racing was my, was my first love. It was my love from the time I was six years old. And there's an inherent risk in yeah. that sport. And there are things that I could have done differently. I could have been more vigilant about checking my bindings and those kinds of things and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, so, so there were definitely mistakes that I made, but I had to really, I was kind of lucky in that, that I didn't, you know, that I didn't do something stupid, that I wasn't like, you know, driving drunk and run over a group of people. And I ended up having an accident after killing a bunch of, you know, and it's like, okay, how can I possibly forgive myself for, for what I've done? Because as you mentioned, there was a sense of like forgiving myself, you know, that I had to forgive myself for whatever situation I was in because things, things went wrong. And as a result of things going wrong, something happened, some decision was not right, but I had to move forward. I mean, it's kind of more than at any time in my life, it was sort of a life and death kind of, kind of experience. Yeah. And, and, and I think in some ways that, that might over dramatize, dramatize. Wow. I can't even talk this morning. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, <laughs> the situation, uh, dramatic size, dramatic size, the dramatic size. Yeah, dramatic size. Yeah. I was I was missing a letter there <laughs> at the moment, really, uh, because it was. Uh, but but you know to, to say that it was life and death, but at the same time, it really. It, it really was. I mean, you're in the hospital. Like anything, anything ultimately can happen in the hospital. I mean, for instance, at one point, uh, they were checking out my kidneys, and they had given me a dye that was based on iodine, I apparently am allergic to iodine. And so my throat started to close and they gave me sure. adrenaline and these kinds of things. And, but like with infections and some of these things, I mean, there, there are things that can happen in the hospital, there's surgery, things that can happen. And so, but it was really, it was really kind of this sense of like, it was as close to close to death as I'd ever come. And I guess that there's a sort of metaphorical death, right? In that I lost the use of my legs and my legs in a lot of ways were a definition of who I was as a ski racer. My, if my legs were strong. I was in a better position to do well. And so, yeah. uh, so yeah, so it was, it was really, I had to give myself permission to kind of move forward and it's it's strange it was the it was the most powerful that i've that i've actually ever been in my life yeah no that makes sense i mean i've spoken to a few people that have gone through just life-changing things like that you know and and it does make sense that what you explain where you have to yeah kind of allow yourself to to yeah to move forward because otherwise it's going to eat you up isn't it and, and you're going to end up doing nothing, going nowhere and just constantly being full of regret and, and all these horrible negative feelings. Um, so in the immediate aftermath of, of the injury, like your first memories of, of being awake and in hospital and how did you kind of start to process the move forward and the concept of rebuilding yourself and, and recovery and all that kind of thing? Moving forward is, I mean, it's, it's a huge challenge, right? At that point, because it's also, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't get out of bed for a long period of time and I couldn't get out of bed and I couldn't, I couldn't stay awake. Mm -hmm. And, and the torture of it was that, that I had just finished exams. And so it's like information that's left on the hard drive kind of thing. And I'd go to sleep and, and relive all the exams that I had just taken, which was, <laughs> you, you leave after this and you think, I just want to sleep for two weeks. And so I was effectively sleeping, but, but I, I hadn't thought to say, I just want to sleep for this unencumbered by the, by the, by the nightmare of, of having to relive all of the exams that I've just taken. And so 
Uh, so yeah, that 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 part I didn't I didn't didn't get my wish correct, I guess, as far as as far as how I wanted it to play out. But uh, but yeah, I mean, it really nobody told me, as I remember, nobody told me that I was paralyzed. The the moment that the doctor told my parents and told my brother, everybody had gone and they'd driven to the to the hospital and they were waiting in, in what they describe as this tiny little cramped waiting room. And they were the only people there in the waiting room. And it took hours and hours as they were doing all these testing, all this testing. And finally, this doctor came out is the who they, they, they describe it. And obviously he's not giving great information. So maybe it's slightly biased, but as this sort of slovenly looking doctor and, and, uh, and, you know, just, just ill-kept and, and uh, all this stuff and everything. And he, mm. he came out and he's like, your son broke his back. Uh, you know, he won't walk again. And the guy turned and left and that was it. You know, they just like, they're there just holding the bag, this sort of emotional bag of like, where do we go from there? And, and they wanted to protect me, I guess, from that kind of, you know, to, to, to allow me to, to determine my own path, to create my own narrative. So they didn't want to tell me that they didn't want to effectively, because, because really the message that comes across at that point is, <clears throat> you know, one, it's you'll never walk again, but two, it's, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, two, it's your life is over. Yeah. Like this is it. Like we didn't, we didn't know. I mean, that's, that's like, that's, that's one of the worst things. Like if you sit around, you know, as a kid, if I sat around and said, well, what's the worst thing that could ever happen to you? You're like, oh, well, I could, I could be paralyzed. Like, that's it. Like that would be one of the greatest fears. And now yeah. I'm living that fear. We don't have any information to, to the contrary, right? To say, oh, no, no, your life's, your life's not over. You can continue to live a full life. It's like, no, you're 20 years old. And the message that you get at that point is, well, I hope you enjoyed the first 20 years because it's over. Yeah. And, and, and so, so I think that that was a gift that they gave me to, you know, to essentially kind of insulate me from that. And supposedly some nurse took it upon herself to tell me and, and she told me, and I don't remember that, but, but that's, that's the story that they told me that this nurse did this. And so I don't remember it, but at the same time, it was what, you know, it was the way that it went was that, that I, uh, uh, yeah, that, that I kind of made it up myself. And there was a bit of a, there was a bit of an athlete kind of uh, ego that, okay. I see that there's something wrong here. I mean, something wrong. Like I feel like the first time that they peeled back the covers, my legs had the muscles on my legs had melted away. Mm. It was, it was amazing. Like my legs, I looked at them and went, wow, my legs look way hairier than they used to. And there was the same amount of hair. It just wasn't, they just weren't spread over as big a space as they had been before. So it was, it was this feeling of like, okay, I see, I see what's happened, but, but I'm an athlete, but I've been pushing myself. I've been pushing myself to the point that I want to quit all fall. And, and so I want to, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to do this. Like I'm going, I'm going to live the miracle. These people don't know who I am. And, call it what you want, call it denial. I mean, which would be probably fairly, fairly accurate. In a lot of ways, I think for me, it was, it was survival. It was survival. It was like, I had to believe that there was the potential for a miracle out there. And, and it shaped, it shaped the way that I approached it and approaching it really was that the worst thing that I could do was to quit, was, was to give in and, and to be, to effectively be depressed. Like that's the, that, that's what, 
that's what the situation wants me to do. It was like me against the situation. And, and if I quit, I let the situation win. And, and, and so, so it was, so it was relatively simple and I had to give my body the best opportunity to heal and believe whatever you want. But I believe that, you know, I believe that the mind and the body are connected and that the, yeah. that, that the emotions can create an environment. And so I couldn't get out of bed but I can create that environment, right? I could create that belief that things were going to get better. And so, so that was, that was my job was to, yeah. was to win each day, to win each moment and to win the moment of like, Oh, this is awful. And it's like, okay, this is awful. And it's what I have to experience right now yeah. for things to get better. You have to get through that bit. Yeah. Yeah. Those little victories, yeah, they must have been so important because I can imagine in that situation, especially when you're just flung into it out of nowhere, never expected this kind of thing. And then all of a sudden, if you were to slip into that depression, like you mentioned, that would be so much harder to get out of. I think when you're already, you know, you've just had this news and your whole life has just been turned upside down. Yeah, if, you, if, you'd, if you'd kind of fallen and, and not had that same willpower, that same drive and motivation to, to keep, keep focused on the future and keep focused on things getting better yet who knows what how it, how differently it could have turned out for you i suppose who knows and and maybe it happens in time and all of those things but for me for me it happened it happened kind of initially it happened and and it's almost the kind of thing that i feel like i can't take credit for i mean it wasn't a, it wasn't a conscious decision that it's like, oh, this is the way to go. It was, this is the only decision. And, and so, so it's almost like ownership. Like, can I take ownership of that decision? It's almost like, I don't know that I, I don't know that I could, you know I mean? You can, I guess I can create an argument that would say that everything that I had done before it was leading me to this decision. And, and, and that's probably self-aggrandizing in some ways too, in that, it wasn't just me, right? It was, it was my parents. It was my family. It was, it was the, the environment that they had created as, as people, right? I mean, that's, that's, I guess that's the big question, you know, like where does, where does this resilience come from? And, and, and I'm sure that a big part of it comes from, comes from what I've learned from, from my parents that, that they, that they were going to move forward, that it was a matter of, well, you do what you need to do. Yeah. That doesn't sound super glamorous, but at the same time, it's like pretty functional. Yeah, definitely. So in terms of the injury itself, then tell me kind of what, like where exactly do you, did you lose movement and do you have feeling and things like that in your legs or is it just nothing at all? Is it? Uh, so, so, Basically for me, it's, it's, I mean, it's funny because everybody talks about like sort of being paralyzed from the, from the neck down or the, or the waist down or whatever, you know, and it's like, okay, so that's the definition of a, of a quadriplegic or a paraplegic, but each vertebrae relates to a certain level of function and sensation. Mm -hmm. And so I broke thoracic 10 and 11, which really is about belly button ish as far as, as far as sensation and w which kind of means that I have sort of the muscles like right below my sternum kind of thing. And, and so, so not a ton of function as far as, as far as like, would you call like sitting muscles, like, like torso muscles, balance, that kind of thing. But at the same time, some of the muscles that, that run the whole way are, are like your lat muscles. I think my lats have taken over a lot of my balance just in that, that they're sort of connected all the way down and I can kind of affect them. And so, so yeah, so, so I don't have any, I don't have any sensation in my legs, hot and cold or, uh, you know, pinprick or any of those things. I mean, I don't have, I don't have any sensation. They are still connected. So, so there's a, 
there's some sort of a, you know, peripheral kind of nervous system or whatever, where you're like, okay, you know, or you feel, you know, you, you bump into something and you go, oh, okay. All right. That probably didn't feel great. It's not like I'm going, ow, 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 ow. You know, I stub my toe or whatever. You know, mm-hmm. those things do happen where I you know, kind of jump into bed or jump in the shower and go, all right, where did, where did that cut come from? You know, what, what happened to my leg? How did I, how did I, uh, how did I, why is it bleeding right now? Uh, so, so yeah, so that's, that's effectively the, the way it was. And, and I went from 175 pounds down to 100, 125 pounds. I mean, I lost like 50 pounds, you know, almost, you know, almost three quarter, almost a third of my weight effectively. Yeah. Mostly muscle I expect at that point. Oh yeah. And so you lose, yeah. you lose all the corresponding strength as well. Right. So I was just, I was ridiculously just delicate and weak Mm. yeah so how did you go then from that moment feeling or not feeling necessarily but being yeah fragile and weak and and you know going through these just immense troubles and challenges to okay i'm going to go and try skiing again it it took a while i started skiing in a mono ski 362 days after the accident 362 362 so three That's days short. within the year yeah nice better better than 367 you got it just under <laughs> exactly exactly yes and so that was back in the middle of exams that i went skiing for the first time uh the following year uh, and was dependent upon the snow coming back because that that was part of it but but no i mean i felt i felt fragile really wow for, for months really. And, and, and it probably, probably really wasn't until that summer that, that I felt like, okay, I can. And and I think it was, I don't know, I'll tell you two stories. So, so one in the hospital, they tell you about, they, they sort of reinforce how fragile you are, where like skin breakdowns are a huge issue. Right. And so you're sitting on your, you're, 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 you're sitting on a, you know, on bones effectively because, because the muscle is effectively atrophied so much. And so, so it's supposedly like 14 pounds of pressure or something like that will, will start to create a breakdown in the skin. And when you get this breakdown of the skin, then eventually you'll either have to spend months like lying on your stomach in order to let it heal or go to surgery. And then things are never exactly the same. And so they're telling you, you know, you've got to do these pressure reliefs where you have to sort of you know, lift yourself up and take the pressure off of, off of your issues. And, and, you know, you feel like, you feel like I pretty much can just screw this up. Like I'm, I, I'm guaranteed yeah. I am going to screw this up. And Easier to screw it up than to not screw it up. <laughs> it really is. Yes. Oh, I forgot it was supposed to be every 15 minutes and it was 17 and a half minutes. And so now I'm going back into the hospital or whatever. And you feel they reinforce this, this sense of feeling fragile or this sense of dealing, feeling delicate. And, and I was, I was getting undressed for bed one night and you know, I'm sort of getting undressed in my chair and, and sort of pulling my pants off and doing all these things. And, and, and somehow, so I have to like, you know, manually kind of like lift my leg up and, and I lost my balance in some way and kind of, kind of, it was almost like my leg basically like, like pulled me out of my chair. Like somehow I just right. ended up on the ground. I'm like, okay. I'm not sure what I'm going to do. I'm on the ground. And, and I figured that I had probably broken my leg in this, in this tumble. So it was nighttime. I, I went to sleep and said, I'll, I'll deal with this in the morning and see what happens. And, and like, I kind of woke up in the morning and nothing was, was super swollen or discolored or anything. And I'm okay. Well, maybe I didn't, maybe I didn't break my leg, but, but that was ultimately kind of what I thought was that, that I was, that I was fragile, that I could be, I could easily be broken. And after I left college, I went to a secondary rehabilitation place called Shake Leg and Shake Leg was a holistic healing center. So a lot of body work, uh, 
Rolfing, Feldenkrais massage, uh, dance. One of the guys who who started it was a was a choreographer, and so so this movement aspect to to recovery, to to health, and and, and so I went there. And one of the first days, the first mornings, I mean, it could have been the first morning, we were doing this wheelchair mobility, this skills kind of thing. And I was with this group of other paraplegics, and some of them were were you know, effectively like, you know, older than I was. They were more experienced. They, they yeah. might not have been chronologically older, but they'd been in a chair longer than I had. And, and so the, one of the first assignments was we had to go from, you know, from where we were to like the tennis courts over the grass. And in order to go over the grass in your, in your chair, you have a couple of choices, right? You're, you're pushing along and the wheels in front, the, what we call the casters are smaller wheels. And so they don't roll over things the way that the big wheels would do. And so if there's a, you know, if there's a clump of grass and this wasn't, this was not your, your, uh, you know, golf fairway kind of situation. This was, these were clumps of grass and little divots and stuff like that. And, and so yeah. you had two choices, either you kind of, you know, go along and, and hit these things and run the risk of, of effectively becoming Superman, right? And not flying very far, but flying and landing and, uh, or, you, or you do it in a wheelie. And so I was kind of going back and forth and I was not very good, still not very good at the wheelie part of it. I had sort of half mastered it, but, but in perfect conditions. And so, so, yeah, so I was doing this and I fell out of my chair. And I fell into the into the grass and and it was like, well, okay, I guess I get back up because it was effectively it was like a race, right? We were racing, we were doing this thing, yeah. and we were racing. It was like it was like gym class again, effectively. <laughs> and and so I fell and I got back into my chair and went, all right, I guess I can fall down and get back up. And so so I think that's when I when I recognized that I wasn't as delicate as i as i thought i was so. yeah so it gave you a kind of new lease of life a little bit in the sense that i can push maybe these boundaries and mm -hmm. and see what else i can do at that point it's yeah i think more so it was i can fall down and get back up and in, yeah. in a physical way right i mean i guess there's there's still the sort of you know sort of the mental emotional way but in a physical way like that's what i'd always done like you're i was I was a, I was a boy, you know, it's like, Oh, I spent a lot of time falling down got a lot of bumps and bruises, you, you know, chip teeth and end up bloody and things like that and go, oh, okay, well, that was fine. <laughs> Did it feel empowering to be able to do that at that moment after the one in your bedroom where you were kind of, you know, on the floor and messed up your leg? Was it empowering just to get up and be like, okay. Yeah. It was, I think that there were a couple of different moments of realization that I'm still me. I mean, there, there was one in the hospital where it was probably, it felt like the first time that I was really alone because my mother had, had slept in the chair next to my bed. And, and so she was there, you know, trying to do whatever she could to support me. And, <clears throat> and, and it was where I recognized that, Hey, I, you know, I, this is as close to death as I, as I've ever come. And, yeah. and I'm still me. Like, I don't, I don't feel any different than I did before. So maybe I don't have to worry about these things as much as I did. And so, so I guess in sort of like the figurative sense that, that I didn't feel as delicate, that I didn't want to indulge in that fear or let fear, let fear guide me, let fear mm -hmm. usher me through my life. And the physical part was really, yeah, was, was falling in that grass and going, all right, well, you're going to fall down and, and you can get back up. It's, it might be a little bit more challenging than it was before, but you can get back up. And so, so that ultimately is really, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I can say I've given you two stories and, and these seem to be the things that we end up having to learn over and over again it's not just it's not just that you learn them and own them yeah yeah you need the reminders you yeah in every situation you need to remember again so how did you go then from that to yeah what was the catalyst that got you thinking about skiing again and like 
at that point were you even contemplating it or were you you know miles away from that even afraid of it what was your mindset in regards to skiing i thought about skiing i imagined myself skiing when i was still lying in the hospital bed yeah. i knew that i would ski again a friend of mine had asked me while I was still in the hospital if I'd be willing to be in a documentary movie on adaptive skiing. A friend of his was doing a documentary movie on adaptive skiing, and he asked if I'd be willing to be in it, if I'd, if I'd be the through line, if I'd, if I'd learned to ski in front of the camera. And, nice. and I said, yes, I, I knew that I would do it. I assumed that I would ski standing up. I did not assume that I would ski in a mono ski, but... But yeah, I thought I thought I would ski, and you know, and, and and you you imagine those kinds of things. You go through them in your mind. And in college, I was living on the fourth or fifth floor of my dormitory without an elevator, and and, and so I imagined. I thought, okay, well, like back when I was in third grade, and I'd broken my ankle, I'd hopped on one leg, and so. So, okay, if this is the situation, I'm going to get out and I'll scoot up the stairs and that'll be, that'll be the way that, that I'll do these things. And I never, I never ended up doing that, but that was the, that was the imagination was that, okay, well, we're, we're going to do it. I'm going to find a way to ski again. I'm going to find a way to go where I need to go. I mean, I've done that with other stairs. I've not, I didn't do the, it with those stairs at my dormitory, uh, but you know, I'll find a way to go for a run again. I'll find a way to be physical, and I think that that was one, just who I was, and two, it was my world. It was my people. Like yeah. it was my way to share with other people, and I think that that ultimately was kind of, uh, you know, what I needed to do. So that's what I imagined, and I imagined the skiing was going to be a part of it. I didn't. I didn't imagine it would be what it was, but that's what, it, that's what I imagined. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. You couldn't have imagined what it would turn into, I suppose. But so what was that, that first time then? How, how did it come about your first time in, what's it called? The, the, the a ski monoski. You use? A monoski. Yeah. What, what was it like your first time in the monoski and, and how did that come about? Well, it came about, so my coach, guy named Bart Bradford was my coach, my college coach. He was coaching that summer out at Mount Hood where there's a, ski, a snow field. And so it's where we ski during the summertime and you ski from June until August or whatever. And it's wide open and everybody's there training. And he was there coaching a junior group. And there was a, the, the, what was the disabled team at that time is the adaptive team now. And there were monoskis there. And one of his former athletes was one of the coaches for the disabled ski team. And so he saw these guys and saw these guys in monoskis. And I came back in the fall and he called me up and he said, Hey, I've got an idea. Come on down to my office. Well, you know, I want to talk to you about something. And I came down to his office and we were talking and he said, Hey, I saw these guys this summer. Like you should do this. Like, and I was like, oh, all right, that sounds great. And he's like, I want to like, we'll, we'll get you a monoski, which was about a $2,000 item. It was an expensive item. And, yeah. and he said, you know, we'll get you this. I want you to, I want you to continue to be part of the team. And I that's said, awesome. I said, okay, like that's, that's, that sounds cool. And I, meanwhile, he'd seen people skiing in this thing. I'd never seen anybody skiing a mono ski. <laughs> I'd never seen a mono ski. I didn't even know what one looked like, but I said, sure, let's, let's do it. And, and so it arrived, he put it together. One of his, one of his good buddies was a rep for a ski company. And so he gave me a couple pairs of skis and, they got it all set up with the with the outriggers and all that stuff, and and we went to the mountain. And he called, you know, he said, "Hey, everything's all set. Like, let's let's go." And so I went, and it was, you know, there was a bit of pomp and circumstance to a certain extent as well, and just in that that the magazine, the school magazine, wanted to document it. So so I got into it right down, you know, at the ski room just on campus, so ways away, you know, twenty minutes away from the mountain, and and I like sitting in a mono ski on a snowbank and they're taking photos of me for the magazine. And so, 
so that was the first part then got back out of the mono ski and got into the into the van and we went up and got in and got all strapped up and and we had established this earlier right i started skiing at such a young age that i couldn't remember starting to ski so skiing was skiing like we just we just go skiing and he said well what do you want to do and i said i don't know we go to the top right like let's take the lift up and see how this thing works and I had no idea that I would be as awful as I was. I didn't, I didn't end up making one turn that whole day. I, I fell over, fell over getting off the lift. He picked me up. I fell over again, you know, and, and there was part of it like, okay, I know what I'm doing. I've ski raced for 15 years. I, I know how to make this work. I understand that it's different. And, but I had a strategy. I was like, okay, it's kind of like skiing slalom. Like you just kind of, you know, upper body wise, I just kind of stay in the middle and kind of let the ski get out away from me and, and we'll make a turn. And, and that's what I, I went into my first turn and I, I fell over and, and he eventually took his skis off and slid behind me on his boots and held onto my seat so that he could direct me. So he didn't have to pick me up, you know, so that, so that we're not still there. I, I literally, I didn't make one turn that whole day. And it was, even, even when I found the balance, it was the most exhausting thing that I've ever yeah. done. I mean, it yeah. was just, it was so exhausting because my, my world had been turned upside down. I mean, like left and right, left was right, right was left. I mean, up was down. All of these things, like I couldn't, the things that I took for granted, like you get off the lift and you kind of slide to a stop, put your goggles down, like get ready, you know, buckle your boots. Obviously I didn't have to buckle my boots anymore, but these were the things I did over and over again. And I couldn't get from the point of like getting off the lift to that point where you just kind of stop and prepare to take your run, even it was totally flat. Like I, I, I had to think myself through each, each movement, each inch, each increment. I mean, my, my world went from sort of like a relatively big uh, set of sort of assumptions, you know, of like, oh, okay, well, we do this, we do this. And I didn't have to, I wasn't in conscious thought. Whereas yeah. then it became, it shrunk down into like, every moment was a conscious thought. And it was, it was kind of like the analogy I try to draw, try to draw is like trying to translate into a foreign language where eventually your brain kind of turns to mush where you're like, please, let me just talk to my, let me just talk. Like it just goes numb, right? Your brain eventually goes numb, but it's, but it's with a sense of immediacy. So your, your brain is going numb while you're like holding your breath underwater is is the way that that moment felt for me and it was over and over and when i finally made it all the way from the top to the bottom on a on a very easy trail it took it took me over an hour i think and and i was so just like all my muscles had been flexed the whole time you know like just trying to i was at, at max capacity the whole time and i was so exhausted it was like do you want to go take another run and it's like hold on a second. I don't, I don't, I don't know if I have the capacity to sign up for another, another run. So it was, it was one of the hardest things that I'd ever done, but I also was kind of starting over like as a complete beginner with the experience of, of an expert. Yeah. So that was the challenge. That's true. Yeah. But, but with a slightly, you know, the expert had slightly different, yeah, details in the know-how with the skiing and everything. So you, you, you've done it all before, but it's all slightly different. It's all changed. <laughs> so you knew kind of what you had to learn, but yeah, wow, that must have been hard. <laughs> Yes. on that first on that first night or one of the first nights or whatever when you're when you go home after that was there much doubt were you kind of oh can i do this is this did i just make a mistake by asking agreeing to this or like did you have these second thoughts or were you very much like it's hard but still going for it still all in it was it was a lot like the recovery in the hospital yeah. in that it was really hard but I don't think that I could admit how hard it was 
because admitting how difficult it was, was admitting a form of defeat. And I couldn't really allow myself to do it. And, and, you know, I mean, it was just, I just kept plugging away each day because I think that the skiing was representative of my recovery. If I was able to ski, then that was sort of a representation of me being whole and, yeah. and, and that I was okay. And that I was, I was back, I had resumed my life and, and, and I skied every day with the team. I, I competed and, and I don't think that I really sort of exhaled until the very end of the season. And I'd gone to the national championships and again, I'm getting ahead of the story. I apologize, but I'd gone to the, to the national championships. And, and, and so after that, I was getting a racing chair built. So our version of running a three wheel racing wheelchair. And I went to the same company that made my mono ski, which was based in Seattle or just outside of Seattle. Jim Martinson was the guy who founded the company and he'd lost both of his legs to a bouncing Betty in Vietnam. He was, uh, he what, what, sorry, his, I, I just, I might sound stupid, but what is a bouncing Betty? I have a bouncing to, Betty I have is a, is a landmine. Right. Got you. Okay. So, so it's a landmine. So, so he had, he had lost the, uh, lost his legs and, and started this company and built a mono ski kind of, there were a few people who were sort of working on the idea, the concept of a mono ski concurrently. Mm-hmm. And, and so he, he developed one and that's the one that I ended up skiing in. And, and I went out to get my racing wheelchair built because he really, the, the genesis of his company was that he built a chair for himself and won the Boston marathon in the chair that he had built for himself. And so as a result of winning the Boston yes. marathon, people looked at him and said, Hey, that looks like a really good chair. Will you build <laughs> one for me? And so this spawned a company and the company then, you know, went from chairs to mono skis to a variety of other things and stuff like that. And so he, uh, so I was getting a racing wheelchair built, but then he also was a skier. I mean, that was, that was really the culture of his family and he wanted to be able to share it with his kids. And, you know, eventually he originally had said that, Hey, I'll be able to share the, the learning process with the kids. I'll be able to tell them what to do and I'll be there with them as they're learning how learning this sport. And eventually they'll get too good for me. And he's, you know, approaching 75 years old and I'm pretty sure these kids still can't keep up with him. So it's, it's, I think he, it's never happened. It hasn't happened yet. They haven't gotten too good for him and left him yet. But, uh, but he, uh, so I went skiing with him one day while I was getting my racing wheelchair built, we went to crystal mountain, which is his home mountain. And it was, it was just, it was one of those days, like it had been really warm the day before and they groomed overnight. So you've got the frozen corduroy and we got off the lift and he just, he started making turns in his seat. What we call his bucket was, was like almost on the ground. Like he was angulated so far over. And I thought, I think that's when I exhaled when I went, okay, I can't do this yet, but he can and so, so there's a possibility like this and, and I've just been beating my head against the wall and, and sometimes literally like beating my head against the wall kind of thing. Like, like, you know, my outrigger went from the crutch position down into the ski position now as I'm in this icy corral and I fall over and smash my head against the, uh, against the lift shack and things like that. Like that, that happened. That really mm-hmm. did happen. I literally was literally and figuratively beating my head against the wall to do this and watching him. I went, Oh, all right. Like, like this is a possibility. I'm not there yet, but, but I can get there hopefully as a result. At least I've seen that there's a possibility. Yeah. And so moving forward from there, then you just kind of had your eyes open to it can be done. It's possible. There's a, why not me? But then how do we go from there to, all the medals, all the glory being there, like this epic adaptive male skier and just, yeah, all the success you've had, like how, like take me, take me that next step of the journey from that sort of point up to the, up to there. So when I did that movie, uh, which was called to dream again, and we filmed it at winter park in, in Colorado and winter park was the original 
you know, I think it was, it was, I think it was the original, if not, if not the original, one of the original learn to ski adaptive skiing programs. And it was the biggest in the U S. And so, so we were out there and they also had a, a race program. And I saw these guys skiing in mono skis and got to talk to them at the bar that night and say, Hey, wow. Like you guys are, you guys are good. Like, and I, and I used to do that. And they're like, Oh really? You know, and I had seen this woman, Diana Golden, at a ski race and Diana had lost her leg to cancer when she was a kid. She's what we call a three tracker. So she had one ski and two outriggers and actually Diana had gone from two outriggers to two ski poles, but it's still that class. We call them three trackers. And, and so I said, Oh, I saw that. I saw Diana golden at this race. And, and, and one of these guys who was actually, it was all these Kiwis who were there. They, uh, people from New Zealand, they had come up and, and they, the Kiwis and the Aussies, trained at winter park as well during their summertime they were training at winter park and, and and so these guys were all i think there was i think there was one aussie and a couple of kiwis one of the mono skiers michael norton was a was an aussie and so i'm just i'm just talking to these guys and i said hey you know and i'm trying to you know i, I i'm nobody right now and so i'm trying to gain like a little bit of of you know of of credibility i guess and so so I said, Hey, you know, I was, I was at a ski race and I, and I saw Diana golden, you know, and, and, and I knew that she was really good. And so I'm trying to gain some, some, uh, you know, some, some, some credibility that way. And so, and they, and one of the guys, uh, he was kind of a wise ass, you know, he's like, Oh, so, so did she beat you? And I was like, no, 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 she didn't, <laughs> she didn't beat me. And, uh, you know, still trying to gain gain a little bit of credibility because obviously I wasn't that guy anymore. I was like, no, no, she didn't beat me. Uh, but, but that was, uh, so I saw those guys and I was like, Hey, I'm, I'm going to do this. And I figured out that there was a race the following weekend. And so I, I was like, okay, this is it. This is a nationals qualifier. I am completely and totally unprepared. This was, you know, the race was about two weeks into my skiing in a mono ski. So from, wow. from zero, That's crazy. zero to, all right, let's get in a race. Let's see what we can do. And it was me thinking we just went three months forward, but not two well, weeks. Okay. This is a couple of weeks. This is a couple of weeks. And so, so I, I said, okay, this is it. And so I drove over and I, it, it, coincidentally, it was at a place called Mount Sunapee, which was the first area where I had skied when I was three years old and had not been, had not returned since I was three. I think it was like, it was, it was an hour and a half or two hour drive from Middlebury. So I drove over in the morning. My parents drove up from Massachusetts. They, this is ski racing parents, right? you on your weekends, you wake up at five o'clock in the morning and you hop in the car and you drive two hours and spend some time in the mountain, turn around, drive home. And, and they, 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 they actually grew to love it. They really, they really did. They loved it. And so, uh, so I, uh, yeah, I went to the ski race. I was completely unprepared, but I'd been a ski racer. And so, so I, I don't know how this happened. There's a way that you carry yourself. Like I'd looked at, I'd inspected so many courses throughout my life. And, and there's a way that you carry yourself. There's sort of a, there's sort of a cool way of approaching this. And I just synced right into this, 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 and in some ways it's got to be an alter ego. Like it's, it's like going back in time, going back in life or whatever. And so I was, uh, I sink back into it. I sink back into being a ski racer. I had no right whatsoever to act this way, to carry myself this way, but this is what you do. This is how you look at it. And it's like, okay, I'm looking at the course. Okay. I want to make my turn here. I want to make my turn there. I needed to qualify for nationals. This was the only race that was in my region that wasn't like hours drive away, like, like 10 hours drive away. I think there was another one in like Ohio or something like that. And like, I, I would have had to drive 10 hours or something like that just to get to the ski race at a place in Ohio, which is probably less of a ski Mecca than, than, than we were talking about where I grew up in Massachusetts. So so yeah, so I went to it and wanted to qualify for nationals, had no idea how fast I had to go in order to qualify. I just knew that it was way faster than I had ever gone. 
Yeah. And so I went absolutely as fast as I, as I possibly could. And it's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like riding the roller coaster in some ways. I mean, when you get into, into a race course, it's sort of like I got into it and it was like, I jumped onto the roller coaster and then I'm along for the ride. Like there was no way of sort of getting off of the ride other than going through the finish and in, in my mind. And so like I was, I was committed, I was in and, and I ended up uh, in my class with the mono skiers. I ended up winning that first run by like seven seconds, this, this wow. gigantic amount of time. And, and th- there were the top guys in the country, obviously were not there or anything, but there was a guy there who, who had been one of the big wheelchair racers. I had seen him in my very first wheelchair race, this guy, Tom Ferran. And so he was, he was a good athlete. He was a Boston marathon kind of guy. He had won national championships in wheelchair racing and stuff like that on the track. And, and so, so yes, I was like, okay, I beat Tom by, by seven seconds. So that must at least be good. Is it fast enough to qualify for nationals? I don't know. And so I ended up qualifying for nationals that day, but that was my only, only, qualifying i needed two and it was my only qualifying one so so this is this is part of being lucky in that i was in the ski racing world being being at college where my college coach called up and said hey look you you need to look at this guy i realize he doesn't have two qualifying but 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 he's going to be good he's been training with us he's been racing i was racing in the college races which was you know (laughs) which was beautiful and so generous of them to give me a venue to be to 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 you know to be an athlete to to be a peer yeah. and so so yeah so I, so that's what I did and uh, and and you know went to nationals and fell yeah, I think every race at nationals and so I didn't I was supposed to my thought was I was going to make that that, that whoever was at the very first race at Mount Sunapee would recognize the tremendous talent and potential in this, you know, nascent blob of, of mono skier and would name me to the U S team. And, and they didn't do that. And that was a really good decision on their part that they didn't do that. Uh, but I thought like, okay, at each, at each step, this is going to happen. And then when I get to nationals, obviously they are going to name me at nationals and they didn't name me at, at nationals either because I hadn't given them a good reason to do that either. Wow, but that's, that's still amazing. I mean, you did that two weeks after you first uh, first got into the the mono ski. That's insane. Um, and it wasn't a super challenging hill. It was not a super challenging hill. It was it was relatively flat, really. It was it was not a yeah. It was not something you look at and go, "Oh, wow, that's super scary." It was scary to me. But, but you still found a way to take seven seconds off the other people, though. So that's uh, that's just it's, that's amazing. Like, yeah, yeah, impressive. Um, so going forward, I'm a little bit conscious of time. I don't want to take too long, but but I gotta we gotta talk about some of your medals. Tell, how many medals did you win in in skiing? Like after this, uh, after that point, and how long was it as well? Let's not jump straight to that point. How long was it before you had your first Paralympics? So the accident was in December of 1988. My first Paralympics was in March of of 92. Okay. So it was really, you know, what would that be? I mean, that's like, you know, three or four, three years and, and three months or, or four, four months kind of thing, something like that. So, yeah. so that's really, I made the U S team in, in, uh, April of 91. So, so really, you know, from the beginning, it was really basically like my second season that, that I made the U S team, the end of my second season of skiing that I made it. And my third season was my first Paralympics. And so, yeah, so 12 medals total in skiing, my biggest, I, you know, I said early on, I mean, I think I told you that that in the hospital, I, I had this moment of epiphany of like, I'll never be intimidated again. You know, like I've, I've knocked on death's door and, and, and didn't go through kind of thing. And so I don't have any reason to be afraid. And, I know I won't be intimidated. And, and so I said, when I first started out that I was going to be the fastest mono skier in the world and, and my class, I'm in the most disabled of the three classes. So, so the, the most able of the three classes of mono skiers were like the, the amputees who have all the muscles, like down to their, down to their knees, oftentimes kind of thing, or, or sometimes you even have like 
a single amputee who has one completely working leg or something. And those were the most able. My class were, you know, people who really didn't have any sitting balance. We were, we were the ones who were expected to topple over and, but we were all in mono skis. And because we were all in mono skis, I felt like I had to, I had to beat the other mono skiers because the casual fan would look at it and go, well, what's the difference? I can't tell a difference between this guy and that guy. They're all, they're all skiing in the same thing. So I thought, okay, if they're, if I'm going to be recognized as being good, I have to beat these guys. And so I said, I'm going to be the fastest mono skier. And when I said that I was like 30 seconds behind, which is like, you know, which is like, you know, in a downhill, it's like being a half a mile behind, you know, yeah. which is, which is a fairly considerable amount of distance in a ski race where you know, yeah. inches and feet are determining wins and losses and stuff. And so, uh, so, but in, in, I, you know, obviously there was a whole lot of work that went into this, both in terms of adapting my equipment and in training myself and figuring out how I could be really good at each turn in Lillehammer, I ended up winning the downhill. Uh, I was the fastest mono skier that day. So the fastest event at the Paralympics, the biggest event in the world, I beat everybody. And, and so that to me meant that it was about skiing. It wasn't about the disability. It was about, you know, which is really, I think the lesson that I'm trying to learn in life is this idea of like, okay, you know, we have, we have a lot of reasons why we can't do something, but if we can prove that there's a reason why we can, then, then it's pretty good. So, so that yeah. was, that was ultimately what I ended up doing. Uh, won the, you know, won the downhill there. That was your first Paralympics, yeah? No, that was my second Paralympics. So second, I'm, okay. I'm okay. The first Paralympics. First one was in Alberville. Won two silvers in Alberville. Won all four races in Lillehammer. Uh, ended up winning 12. Did four winter Paralympics and three summer Paralympics. So, yeah. so 12 Paralympic medals in the winter and one Paralympic medal in the 200 meters in Sydney in 2000 uh, in the summertime. Yeah, that's amazing. It's so many medals, <laughs> so many wins. Yeah. How does it feel to, to, you know, like you accomplish that dream you had when, when you were, you know, after your, after your injury and you, you wanted to, to come back and prove that you could do this, you could be the fastest skier. And how, how does that feel to, to just see how much you did achieve? Yeah, it was in a lot of ways, it was a stepping stone. I mean, it was kind of like, I wanted to do, I wanted to be the best in the world. But I also wanted to prove to myself that that I could do that. And and part of it was I joined a group that I had no desire to join, right? I mean, nobody asks for a disability, like, oh yeah, I'm swayed by the parking spaces or whatever, you know? You're not, you're not, that's not the way that life goes. And so uh so I felt like in a lot of ways I needed to be able to demonstrate that I, I continued to be a viable human being and being able to be the best in the world forced, forced a stretch of people's imagination in order to, for one, for a guy who wasn't supposed to be able to do that, to do that. And, and that was the objective was that it was a platform. It was, it was an opportunity for me to continue to stretch that imagination and, 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 and to have the viability, you know, to have the, 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 you know, to be for people to go, oh, okay, like he's legit. He's not just talking like he, he's yeah. actually lived it. And so that was, that it was, it was, it was an amazing feat, but it was also in some ways an amazing feat in that it was the start. Yeah. Yeah. Again, like I say, I'm conscious of time and I know we're not going to be able to do the rest of these things justice, but, um, Let's say so you so you won all these these medals. You just achieved everything, basically everything that you could have hoped to achieve at, at Paralympics and the the summer and winter versions. But let's get on to briefly Kilimanjaro, and you being the first, pretty much non-assisted or almost non-assisted, slightly assisted, uh, paraplegic to climb Kilimanjaro, the tallest mountain in Africa. How did this come about? How did you? How did the thought process go to? Yeah, I want to do that. Yeah, talk me through it a little bit. And again, like I said, I'm I'm conscious of time, but let's let's see if we can summarize it in a, in a nice way. With yeah, sure. Uh, so it's 
you know, getting Kilimanjaro in a lot of ways, we're, we're all climbing a mountain, right? I mean, the metaphor of a mountain is out there for all of us each day. Each day is hopefully a few steps up the mountain kind of thing, up our, up our proverbial mountain. And um, that's the, you know, that, that's, that's what brought me to Kilimanjaro. I felt like I, in some ways after, after retiring, I'd lost my, I'd lost my platform. I wasn't an athlete anymore. That was, it was on my resume, but I wasn't, you know, it was almost like I wasn't valid. And, and mm. I've, I, it forced me to kind of go through that, that identity crisis of who am I? What am I all about? So that was, that was the identity crisis that I went through. And I thought, okay, I need to have a goal that's effectively bigger than me that, that, that racing, I was trying to, I was trying to essentially put an example out there that would force people to look at me differently, but also other people with disabilities differently. And, and Kilimanjaro was the far grander way to do that and to be able to tell the story. Yeah. So, you know, we told the story in a documentary film because I felt like if we didn't tell the story, it didn't happen. So, so the idea of, of climbing Kilimanjaro was, was to get out there and, and get to the top of a 19, 19,340 foot mountain, 41 foot mountain, uh, 5,895 meters or something. My meter part of it is not 96, all that. 96, I think. But yeah, I think you're pretty spot on. I'm pretty close. Okay, good, good, yeah. good. I'm not. It, we, the metric system really still hasn't taken hold <laughs> over here. I don't think it's, I don't think it is. I think we're done. I think we're sticking with the <laughs> Oracle and, and that's going to be it. But, uh, but, uh, yeah, so I thought Kilimanjaro. I, I wanted to, I, I wanted to see if I could, if I could do it, you know. And and by doing it is, is really to, to change the narrative from that's too bad. It's too bad what happened to you. It's too bad that your life is over. To, to what do you do? Which is really ultimately probably the way that we should start a conversation with just about, about everybody. Like, what do you do? What's what's important? And it might be your profession. It might be you know, whatever, whatever really is your passion as well, which hopefully yeah. is the case. And so, so that's, that's where Kilimanjaro came out and, and yeah, I climbed it in a four wheeled hand cycle, a hand cycle that kind of looks like a Mars Rover, Mar married to arm pedal power. So I pedaled with my hands and had, had a gear that I think that like, you know, one revolution was like, was like an inch or something like that, a forward movement, yeah. so a tiny little, tiny little gear. And I think I stayed in that gear almost the whole time. So it was like, wow, you know, my hands were like a fan. Basically, I was just <laughs> making a lot of revolutions, which is what I had to do. I had to turn myself into an engine. I couldn't musk, you know, the muscular part, I couldn't muscle it. I couldn't yeah. just sort of like just hammer along. I really just had to turn it into RPMs and just kind of keep, keep a constant pace and roll over stuff. Wow. Was there anything recording, like how many rotations or uh, revolutions? We estimated, one of the people who worked with me estimated, he did some math and that it was like 528,000 revolutions. And so uh, wow. it, it was a lot of them. I don't, yeah. I, mean, I, I don't yeah. know what the, you know, what <laughs> the exact the plus minus is on that. You know, it's like, <laughs> maybe, maybe that's right on the money. Maybe it's like, maybe it was double. I don't know. Hey, who knows? Yeah, yeah, sure. But how, and how long did it take you to get up? Six and a half days up and a day and a half down. Yeah. So. Was that just the most exhausting week of your life or how did it compare? No, actually, that was the easiest week of the two years leading up to it because all I had really? to do was pedal. I just yeah. had to pedal when I was going up. And, the, and, you know, before I was, you know, creating a team, I was raising money. It was 2008. It was really hard to raise money. Uh, it, yeah, I was managing people. I was doing every time, every day, you know, sort of like every day I wake up going, I have no idea what I'm doing. And I told this to a friend and he's like, Oh, that, that means you're on the right path. And I'm like, well, thanks. So, you know, got to choose your friends wisely, I think is what it comes down to. Like it, it was, it was really hard. Whereas when I was on the mountain, I knew that, that I had one job. All I had to do was pedal for, you know, six to 10 hours. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And I guess it was, yeah, a whole ordeal getting the bike and everything suited to you and the, the hand cycle, sorry, getting everything suited to you and made. And that must have been a lot of time and effort. But yeah, what an achievement. What an achievement. Um, 
when you had to get helped at one point right over over a particularly rocky bit of terrain i think from what i've kind of gathered you struggled with that like you wanted to do it unassisted didn't you the unassisted part i felt like in some ways the only way that i could be successful was to be the first unassisted you know and so in my mind it's kind of like you know yeah. roger bannister breaking the four minute mile and in 1954 right so like forcing people to look at things differently because they had said that it couldn't be done like that a human wasn't supposed to run that fast you couldn't run that fast or like chuck yeager breaking the, the speed of sound that that a an airplane would rattle apart the rivets would pop out and it would fall out of the sky and 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 that's kind of what i wanted to do was to be able to do something that forced the general public to look at it differently, to look at me differently, but also to be able to see, you know, a billion people in the world who in a lot of ways are invisible because from the time we're little, we're taught not to stare at someone who looks different. Yeah, that's true. What what would you say to, you know, either a kid or a parent that's telling their kid not to stare at somebody in a wheelchair or somebody, you know, that looks a bit different? How, how how can we approach that better? Because it, you know, there's two sides to it, aren't there? Obviously, nobody wants to be stared at like they're a piece of meat, but at the same time, nobody wants to be ignored and felt like they don't exist. What's the happy medium? Just tell kids they're allowed to be interested and things like that. Any thoughts on all that? I think the the curiosity is is the greatest thing that we can have, right? That, yeah, and and. And, and you want to, you want it to be, you know, you don't, nobody, as you said, nobody wants to be the freak, right? You don't want to be the freak and, and be like, oh, wow, well, you know, like this is, this is, this is that or whatever, you know, like you don't want somebody to make you into the freak, but the curiosity is, is sometimes getting beyond that, right? Is getting beyond and, and getting to, hey, Ben, like what matters to you? You know, like, yeah. like this is, the, and, and I think that that's, I think that when we do that, we end up share, finding out that we share a whole lot more and, but it's hard. It's a hard situation because I don't think that we're taught to create questions. We're, mm -hmm. we're, we, we don't, we learn it sort of by, by, you know, mimesis, you know, by, by following people around us. We learn it by, by, you know, trial and error, those kinds of things. But, but I don't think that there's a way that we really learn to ask a question of somebody, especially when the thing that's, that's come going through our mind is the thing that we feel like we shouldn't say, yeah. which, is, which is the thing that we eventually, you know, that we, that we gravitate toward, right? It's like, oh, don't say that, don't say that. You know, it's like, oh, hey, wow, it's gotta be really hard to get your mustache to look like that, you know? Which I'm sure is not that offensive for you. Uh, but it is really hard. I would imagine it's a difficult process here. <laughs> yes. But, uh, but, you know, but, but that's sometimes is the thing that we're drawn to is, are the things yeah. that are the differences. And, and can we take a step from the difference to, to the similarity and maybe get a bit more of somebody's story? Because if we're, if we're constantly asking about the differences in a lot of ways, we're reinforcing mm. the, the difference. And, yeah. and, and we're provoking sometimes the response that we don't want to have because somebody else, that, that person on the receiving end feels cornered or whatever. And it's like, why are you, mm. you know, why are you doing this to me? Why are you, why are you making me feel like a freak? And you know, I don't want to feel like a freak or whatever. And, and so I think it is trying to find those, those things that we share. I had a, you know, I mean, it's, and, and none of us are free of it. I was at the gym one day during the middle of the summer back when I was competing or middle of the winter. And there were two people in the gym and this woman had bilateral amputations. So she was walking around on carbon fiber prosthetics. And I was, I happened to be reading a book about a mountain climber who had lost both of his legs because he'd been caught on a mountain, caught in a storm on a mountain, got frostbite, got gangrene and his legs were amputated. And so as I'm watching this woman walk around the gym, just the two of us in the gym, I'm thinking, wow, like, like, I wonder if she's a mountain climber. I wonder if, and, and I'm like, no, you can't ask that question. You can't that, like, that's not the question. Like, did you caught, is that frostbite? Did you get caught on the, what was the mountain? Where were you? How did that feel? And, uh, and so I didn't say anything. And she came by me at one point and I was doing like flies or something. And she went, wow, that's a lot of weight. And I went, 
oh, you mean it can be that easy? Like it can be that easy, just like a simple question, a simple observation. And, yeah. and I think we have to make it simpler for ourselves to be able to, simpler for ourselves and for other people to be able to connect. Yeah, no, definitely. Definitely. So look, we're getting towards the end of our, our time here. I don't want to keep you all day. So uh, let's let's kind of get to a point where I can wrap this up. I, I, I would have loved to have gone into a few other things, but time has a way of doing this, doesn't it? I would have loved to have talked about how you met the, the Dalai Lama and a few presidents. And, you know, we probably could have talked more about the Paralympics and, and all sorts of things. And Kilimanjaro, really. We kind of rushed it a little bit. It took you a week. We did it in about seven minutes. But... <laughs> But again, um, just to finish this out, you are very well renowned, maybe world renowned for your commencement speeches, um, huh. which is probably going to help you to do what I'm going to ask you to do. And that's deliver a message just to anybody that might be listening. Um, it can be about whatever you want it to be, inspirational, whatever you, whatever you want it to be about or, or relating to. So, yeah, if you want to take it away and, and share some share some words. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think that the motto that I try to live by, which, which really comes from being a ski racer, uh, I guess it probably is also partially colored by having had an accident that landed me in a wheelchair is the idea of it's not what happens to you. It's what you do with what happens to you. The ski racers that I respected the most were the ones who, who could perform when everybody else had a great excuse not to, when it was the weather, when it was the conditions, when it was the competition, whatever it was, you know, the definition of somebody who really is successful is the person who, who can get past the, the seeming obstacles. And, and I think that that's a great message for life in general, a great, a great mindset to have. It's like, oh, well, things are going to go wrong. And it can be an opportunity for me to prove how good I really am, you know, both to myself and to other people. So, so certainly it's not what happens to you, it's what you do with what happens to you. But but I think the other part is the, the greatest risk we take is taking no risk at all. We talked about this before and it's, you know, as I continue to grow older, which obviously you are growing older as well. We're all growing older, but, but it, it seems like it's easy to look back on our lives and think, Oh, well, the best part of who I am has already happened. And, and that seems like a depressing way to approach it to, and, and, you know, you, but there's a painful part too, right? The painful part of learning mm. is, you know, learning, growing and dreaming. Like it's, it sounds great. Like you should continue to learn. And you're like, yeah, but I feel like I really don't get it. My brain has gone numb. So, you know, the idea of, of the greatest risk we take is taking no risk at all of this risk of, figuring out who we are. That's where we continue to forge who we are as, as people. So, so those, I'll, I'll give you two messages, right? It's been a long time. We've been a long talk. So I'll give you two, two little nuggets. Great value. That's amazing. I love that too, for the price of one. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chris. I really appreciate this. I had a lot of fun and uh, yeah, take care. All the best. You're welcome. Thank you, Ben. This is wonderful. Thanks for listening to that conversation with Chris Waddell. If you liked it, please check us and Chris out on social. You should also give a listen to his podcast, Chris Waddell Living It. All links are in the description. Thank you, Chris, for talking to me and for hopefully inspiring some of those who listened. Be nice, be happy, be cool.